Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you again on this beautiful Lord's Day. What a, what a beautiful song that is. God used the trials to form me into the likeness of Christ. Wow. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I just want to read one verse from here and talk about God's love and how he showed it to us while we were still sinners. Verse 8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love is a very difficult thing to define in the English, I think, because it's so overused. And anything that's overused is difficult to define, but it's not something that's hard to understand. When you see it, when it is shown to you, real, sacrificial, undying, selfless love, you get it. And that's what God did. God shows it to us. And I want you to underline that word shows. Many of your, your translations probably say demonstrates, and it is present tense. He presently, currently is showing you his love. If you have an older translation, like the Old King James or Old American Standard, it'll say commends or commendeth. I was listening to somebody read the scripture from the Old King James recently and was in this text, and the, it says God commendeth his love. And I thought I, I had not heard it that way or, or had forgotten I heard it that way. And it sent me looking about this word commends in the Greek. And sure enough, all the Greek lexicons that I checked all say it, it can be defined in the English as commends. In fact, that may be its, its best definition. So then I got to thinking about the word commends in the English. And it can be used in a couple of different ways. Like to praise somebody, the government commends you or the CEO commends you. Or it can be used as, as like a recommendation. And that's why I have the title of the lesson like I do. West, W-U-E-S-T, he has a book called Greek Word Studies, or Words in the, in the Greek New Testament, and he defines this particular word as holding up in favorable view, or to recommend. And I just got to thinking about that, standing next to somebody, or God standing next to us and saying, I recommend my love go to this person. Why would God do that? Why would God commend us as if we were worthy of receiving his love? Because the whole context of Romans chapter 5 is that we're not worthy. In verse 6 of Romans chapter 5, he says that we were weak. In the same verse, he says that we were ungodly. In verse 8, the verse that we just read, he calls us sinners. And then in verse 10, he calls us the enemies. So put that all together. Why would God commend his love, recommend his love, go to weak, ungodly, sinning enemies of his? And I have no answer other than to say that is what grace is. Grace is when God treats you and I, the unworthy, as if we were him standing next to you and saying, I recommend my love go to you. And how did he do that? Christ died for us. I want to tell you the story about God's letter of recommendation. I just want to tell you the story about how Christ died and the events surrounding it. You can close your Bibles, but this may be the most scriptural lesson I ever preached. I just want to combine the four accounts and talk with you about what happened. And at the very, very end of the sermon, I want to tell you why I'm doing it this way. But Christ, he was arrested in a garden. It was one of his favorite places to go, to pray, to teach, to be in solitude. And he went there that night to pray that what was going to happen would not happen, that the hour, the cup might pass from him. But above all in his prayer, 
more than the cup passing, what he wanted was the Father's will to be done. But he was distressed. He was really troubled. He would tell his disciples that night, I am so distressed even to the point of death. And he was sweating profusely with his face on the ground, begging his Father. But above all, your will be done. His Father dispatched an angel to be with him in the garden and to comfort him. The scripture actually says to strengthen him. Whatever that angel said, he did a great job because Christ went through with it. Tis midnight on Allah's brow. We sing that song, tis midnight and from heaven is born the song that angels know. Unheard by mortals are the strains that sweetly soothe the Savior's woe. Unheard by mortals. We don't know what that angel said, but praise God he was dispatched. Judas had already betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And he secured a Roman band of soldiers. And with them and some Jewish authorities showed up at the garden. And Jesus was ready. John said he came out. He came out to actually to greet them. He said, whom do you seek? And one of the strangest miracles happened. You remember what John says happened to that Roman band of soldiers? They actually fell down to the ground. Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. And they all fell backward. They all fell to the ground. And I have no idea why that was. But it shows that they had very little power. They had no power over the Son of God. They didn't stand a chance against Him. And maybe while they were still struggling to get up, He said, Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am He. If you seek Me, let these men go. And during that time, Judas kisses him. He says, Rabbi, will you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And Luke's account says, the disciples knew what was about to happen, and so they drew swords. Shall we strike with the sword, Master? Jesus said, put your swords away. But before he could say that, Peter had cut off the ear of one of the servants of the high priest, Malchus. Put your swords down. Everyone who bears the sword will die by the sword, Jesus said. Do you not think that I could call 12 legions of angels and get out of this mess? And he healed Malchus's ear. Isn't that remarkable? He didn't have to do that. But I imagine that would have been a a convicting thing. I hope Malchus became a disciple. He heals Malchus's ear. And he would tell that band of soldiers, the Jewish authorities, have you come out with swords and clubs as if to to arrest a thief? I was with you day after day in the temple and you did not seize me. But it's your hour. It's the hour of darkness. And they led him away. They led him away first to Annas, the father-in-law of the current high priest, And Annas, it says, questioned him about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus said what he said in the garden. I spoke openly. I've done nothing in secret. If you want to know about my disciples, about my teaching, ask those who heard me. And one of the officers standing nearby struck him in the face. Is that how you speak to the high priest? He said, if I said anything wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if I said the truth, why do you strike me? And they led him away to the current high priest, Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was gathered together with the the elders and the scribes and that Sanhedrin council. And they sought evidence. They sought evidence to come up with something because they wanted to put him to death. They, They wanted to find a capital crime, but they couldn't find any. And so they started hiring people to lie, to bear false testimony. But even about their false testimony, they could not agree. Finally, they had two people come forward with something similar, but even Mark says about this comment, they didn't agree. But the two people say, we heard him say he would destroy the temple and in, and in three days build another not made with hands. But of course, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus had said, you, you Jews, you tear down the temple, speaking about his body. And in three days, I'll show you how indestructible I am. But again, even about that, they didn't agree. 
So Caiaphas turns to Christ and says, I adjure you by the living God, which is interesting because that's who Jesus is. I adjure you by your own self. Not that that's what Caiaphas meant. I adjure you by God. Tell us whether you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, I am. From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And Caiaphas tore his clothes, said, you have heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? The council all said, death. And they begin to spit on him, strike him in his face, and blindfold him. And say, prophesy, who is the one that, that hit you? And I think it was, not that it matters, but I think it was the council that was doing these things. Blaspheming him and blindfolding him. And the reason why I think it's the council, these religious men, these leaders of the Jews, is because when it says that he got handed over to the guards, the guards then received him with many blows. They came together that night to decide whether they were actually going to go through with it, and their judgment was, was no different. Very, very early in the morning. So they led him off to Pilate. And they didn't want to go into Pilate's headquarters because it was the Passover. They didn't want to defile themselves. They wanted to take the Passover. So these hypocrites stood outside. And Pilate actually met them and said, What accusation do you have? Evidently he knew that some prisoner was being brought to him. What accusation do you have? They said, We, we found this man misleading our nation claiming to be a king and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Don't forget about that, Pilate. And Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you have said so. And almost after just one question, a one question trial from Pilate, I know there's more, but just after one question, as if that claim was totally laughable looking at Jesus, Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. But they were insistent. No, 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 Pilate, Pilate. He stirs up people. He won't stop. He teaches everywhere he goes, even from Galilee to this place. He stirs up all the people. And when Pilate found out he was a Galilean, he said, Herod has jurisdiction over there. And Herod happened to be in town for the Passover. So he sent him off to Herod. And Herod was glad. He wanted to see Christ. He wanted to see some miracle from Christ. And the text says in Luke that Herod questioned him at some length. And Jesus never said a word to Herod. Never gave an answer to one question. But I'll tell you who did. The scribes were standing right by as Herod was questioning him. And the text says they were vehemently accusing him. He does this. He does that. Jesus not answering. Herod sends him back. But not after they dress him up like a Saturday Night Live comedy skit. They dress him up like a king. I mean, if he says that he's a king, he needs to look like one. They, so they dressed him up in a costume and they send him back to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Second time he's asked. Are you asking that on your own accord or did someone say that about me? Jesus said. Am I one of the Jews? Your own people handed you over to me. What have you done? That's when Jesus told them about his kingdom not being of this world and about his purpose in coming to the world to bear witness to the truth. Pilate brought Jesus out to the crowd and said, I find no guilt in him. But the crowd just said, away with him and free Barabbas instead. See, they had a, they had a tradition that the Romans, because Jews were under Roman subjugation, they would let one of the, the prisoners go during the time of Passover. And Barabbas had been arrested for insurrection and for murder. Give us Barabbas and away with this man. And Jesus said, what, what shall I do with your king then? And they said, crucify, crucify. Why? Pilate arguing with the crowd. What evil has he done? But no answer was made. Just crucify. And the crowd started to get riled up too much. So Pilate seeks to calm them down. So you know what he has him do? He has Jesus flogged to squelch the crowd. He's still not convinced that he's going to crucify Jesus. Matthew and Mark says that they had him scourged and then delivered him over to be crucified. But John gives us a little bit more. But first, 
they had him flogged. You remember what the scripture says in Isaiah about Jesus, the prophecy, I gave my back to those who strike. I gave my face to those who pluck out the beard. And I did not hide my face from spitting. But that first part, I, I, I gave my back to those who strike. You know, when they tied up Christ, he never fought them. So they would tie a man's arms in front of him, stretching his back, you know, stretching out the skin just to make it as thin as possible. And then they would take this, these cords, these leather cords, if you will, that had metal or bone in them, and they would just flay a man's back, and it would be all stretched out. And after a while, after so many whips, you can imagine the metal or the bone. It's not touching skin. It's getting all flesh. It's getting muscle. The horrors of scourging were so bad, many people did not live through scourging. You know who did? Jesus did, but so did I. By his stripes I am healed. Through his blood I can kneel. By his oppression I worship my king, my savior and king. So they flayed his back. And when they got done with that, they handed him over to the soldiers. And that's when the soldiers had their way with mocking. They, bit, they put a purple robe on him. And they put a reed in his right hand. And they twisted together a crown of thorns and they put that on Jesus' head. And they began to mock, Hail, King of the Jews! I don't know if they stood at attention like we do in, in today's military, but you can imagine them bowing down. We sing a song, number 198. We're going to sing it in just a moment. Exalted. Worshipped with contempt is one of the lines. You ever wonder what this is talking about? It's, that's one of the scenes that it's talking about. They bowed down. And they called him a king, but they didn't mean it. And then they took the reed out of his right hand, and they beat his head over it. And they spit on him. But Christ didn't hide his face. You know, if I was getting spit on, you know what I'd be doing? I doing everything I can to... But the scripture in Isaiah says he didn't hide his face from spitting. You could just see Christ just standing there tall. He despised the shame, but he embraced the shame of it all. And then while, while they were done with that, with the purple robe and the crown of thorns still on, Pilate brought him out, seeking to release him. He sought to release him after the flogging, John's account says, in John 19, verse 12. Still seeking to release him, he says, what evil, what evil has he done? And the crowd, you know what I think was going through Pilate's mind? Having flogged this man, you know, they used to examine people by flogging. In Acts 22, verse 24, one of the Roman guards who had arrested the Apostle Paul talked about him being brought into the barracks and have him examined by scourging. That's how they got confessions out of people. But evidently, Pilate, having flogged Jesus, was still convinced of his innocence. They didn't get a confession out of Christ. But I'm sure he thought, if they could just see how beaten he is, if they could see how bloodied he is, and how disfigured he is, and I mean that literally in Isaiah 52, it says that his appearance was marred more than human semblance. If somebody in Nazareth had been in town and looked at Jesus standing there with his purple robe and crown of thorns, beaten and bloodied and disfigured, they would have said, is that Jesus? He was that marred. And I'm sure Pilate probably thinks, if they could just see this, that I've taken care of this, the Jews will say, okay, <laughs> he's he not going to be teaching our temple anymore. He's not going to be teaching in the synagogues anymore. He's learned his lesson. Let's go take the Passover. That's not what they said. It wasn't, enough. it wasn't enough for him to be disfigured or beaten or flogged. Crucify! And he argues with them again. What evil has he done? You crucify him. And then they, they said, no, we have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God. And Pilate brought him back into the headquarters and said, Who, where are you from? 
This evidently set in with Pilate, and he was getting scared, the Scripture says. Where are you from? But Jesus made no answer. Do you not realize, Jesus, that I have the power to crucify you? You have no authority. You would have no authority, he tells Pilate, unless it were given you from above. You're right where God wants you to be, Pilate. And Pilate brings him out again, seeking to release him again. And the Jews say, don't you dare do that, Pilate. You are no friend of Caesar. For everyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. And evidently, that was the straw that broke Pilate. He sat down at the judgment seat, the Gabbatha, the stone pavement, and said, what shall I do with your king? And those Jews, shame on them. We have no king but the Caesar. And he washed his hands said, I am innocent of this man. And they said, his blood be on us and on our children. And they delivered him over to be crucified. They took off his robe and they put his own clothes on him. And they put that big tree trunk on him so that he could carry it to the place of execution. And he did the best he could for as long as he could until they compelled Simon of Cyrene to bear his cross for him. Several of the women were standing by while he was marching to the place of Golgotha, weeping, bawling their eyes out. Jesus told them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves. Worse days are coming than this. When they got to the place of execution, they crucified him, which in our English term, terms, probably the best term that we can come up with is that they impaled him. They took a big spike and they would drive that through his, through his feet to this big tree trunk. And think of it as a tree trunk. You, you, you can't drive spikes into flimsy pieces of wood. It has to be a big, strong, thick piece of wood. And it's got to be strong enough not only to hold a spike, but it's got to be strong enough to hold, let's say, a 200-pound man for hours and even days. Sometimes crucifixions took that long. So think of it as a tree trunk going up 12, 15 feet. And here's another reason why I like to use the word tree, because cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That was a curse of the old law. You hang on a tree to die, you're a cursed man. And God the Father put His own Son under a curse that He might release me from mine. So they impaled his hands, they impaled his feet on these big tree trunks. And then they would throw these big tree trunks into big holes in the ground that were dug, you know, four or five feet down. And that's what would hold it erect. And while they did that, or just after they did that, Jesus said, Father, forgive them! They do not know what they're doing. Were truer words ever spoken than that? They didn't know what they were doing. Who in that crucifixion scene would have guessed that God's love was being commended? They, they had no clue. But because of that, Jesus wanted them to be forgiven. How amazing is that? And people began to revile Him. Mocked by all the wise, that's another line from the exalted song, number 198. These wise people, tongue-in-cheek, and the song uses it tongue-in-cheek as well. They begin to say, come down from the cross, you, you Christ, you chosen one. Let him come down. If, if that's who he is, and we will believe, and some of the, even the Roman guards begin to say, come down from the cross. And some of the passers-by were wagging their heads and saying, he, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. And even the thieves that he was crucified between, even the thieves were were railing at him. And evidently, one of those thieves who was railing abuse at him had a change of heart, while the other one was saying, Are you not the Christ? Come down from the cross and save yourself and save us too. One of them had the fear of God set in, evidently. And I say the fear of God because listen to what he says to the other thief. Do you not even fear God? since we are under the same sentence of condemnation and we are suffering justly, but this man has done nothing wrong. Were truer words ever spoken than that? 
this man has done nothing wrong. Not only was he not guilty of capital crime, he never sinned. Remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And you get a sense of where Jesus' mind was at when he was hanging. He wasn't thinking about all the abuse or even the pain. Oh, I'm sure it crossed his mind. But he was thinking about where he was going. And he looked down at the cross and saw his mother and the disciple John. He said, woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. And I love the obedience of John. The scripture says from that hour, John brought Mary into his own home. I'd like to think John at some point put his arm around Mary and said, Mom, you're coming home with me tonight. He did it, and he did it immediately. Three hours into the crucifixion, darkness fell over the whole land. We just sang a song, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Was it verse 2 or 3? Well might the sun hide and shut his glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. Scripture gives no reason for why darkness fell over the whole land. But nature was convulsing. Nature was showing its, its outpour of love or just the, the agony of it all, the injustice of it all. Six hours in, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they thought he was talking about Elijah. And so they said, Let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. But while they were talking about Elijah, he cried out, I thirst! And so they got a reed, and they soaked it with sour wine, and they, they held it up. You ever think about how high Christ was? He was high enough that they could not hold up a sponge. They had to put it on a reed and hold up this sponge. And I don't know that it matters how high he was, but thinking about how high he was makes me remember the passage when Jesus says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all, all men to myself. And there he was, high, lifted up, drawing men to himself. He wasn't talking about the ascension, and he wasn't talking about being lifted up in people's hearts. He was talking about the manner in which he would die. And the Jews knew that because they responded by saying, we've heard that the Christ is to live forever. Who is this son of man that you're talking about? After he tasted the wine, he said, It is finished. Father, into your hands I place my spirit. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. He yielded up his spirit. And I always appreciated the fact that he's the one that gave it. You hear the scripture? Take it literally. He gave up his spirit. My brother wrote an article back in 2011 called A Physician Looks at the Crucifixion. The physician being him, he's, he's a doctor. And he uses all kinds of medical terminology, hypervolemic shock, cardioembolism, arrest, and I'm probably not even pronouncing those right. But my brother, before he's a physician, he's a disciple of Christ. He says at the very end of the article, paraphrasing, had he been the attending physician filling out the death certificate of Jesus Christ, he would not have used any medical terminology. What he would have put down in the cause of death category is he gave himself. On all death certificates, there's a second cause. It's the cause of the cause. So the first one is like all medical-based, like loss of blood, and then the second cause it's like, why did, they, why did they lose so much blood, like a gunshot wound? And in the second cause on this fake death certificate that he put together, he put down, my sin. He gave himself for my sin. Other contributing factors. There's a, there's a spot on a death certificate. For God so loved the world.
You know why I preach this lesson like this? We got a lot of stuff going on at Monta Vista. Some of you have lost family members. There's marriage issues. There's family members of yours that have abandoned other family members and you're picking up the pieces. We got money problems. We got people wanting to leave the faith for reasons we don't know. We got a lot of stuff going on. And I'm not airing out any dirty laundry. I'm here to say that when life is spinning too fast for me and I'm getting too stressed out, you know what brings me back to square one? You know what helps my faith more than anything? Is just a study about the death of Christ. He's what matters. What he did is what matters. And that love got a hold on Paul. That love got a, got a hold on Paul, and it changed Paul. And I ask you, listen please, why won't, it let it, why won't you let it change you? Please get out your songbooks and turn to the Song of Invitation. Why won't you let it change you and turn away from sin? Why won't you let God's love, God recommended his love to you, an unworthy person, let it get a hold on you. Give your life to Christ in baptism this very day. Will you come? As together we stand and sing.